Thank you very much for the fine introduction. And that's perfect pronunciation, by the way. So hi, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be speaking here. My name is Petar Velichkovic, and I'm a staff research scientist at DeepMind and an affiliated lecturer at the University of Cambridge. And today I'll be telling you about some of our recent work, which showed how even with simple interventions from artificial intelligence, you can make potentially significant impacts uh, on pure mathematics. And it's joint work with all of the fantastic people written on this slide, both from DeepMind as well as our mathematical collaborators from the universities of Oxford and Sydney. So maybe just a little disclaimer before this talk begins. Like I've really enjoyed the talks yesterday and today so far. Uh, and I'd like to just make a note at the beginning that I'm a bit of an imposter in this room. Like I've done an undergrad course in quantum computing and I've worked with QML researchers in the past, but uh, that's as far as my QNLP skills go. Uh, I've agreed with the organizers that today I'll talk to you about some of our recent work on pure mathematics. But beyond that, I'd just like to preface this talk by mentioning that I am involved in some related uh, pieces of research that might be quite interesting to some of you in the audience, and I'm very happy to chat about them after the talk if you're interested. So I'll just briefly survey them for the first two minutes of this talk. The first one you might find interesting is my work on geometric deep learning, geometricdeeplearning.com, which is actually a book I'm co-writing with Michael Bronstein, John Bruna, and Taco Cohen. We already have a 150-page proto book out on the archive, and we just recently signed a contract with MIT Press for a proper book release next year. And in this book, what we try to do is we use geometric principles of invariance and equivariance to basically explain all of deep learning as it is today. And it turns out that this blueprint is fairly pop, uh, powerful because if you have the right choice of domain, the right choice of symmetry group over that domain, and some kind of interesting mathematical manipulations in the middle, you can re-derive basically all of the popular or uh, usual suspects like convnets, graphnets, deep sets, transformers, LSTMs, and so on, including some very useful models that live in the middle on more exotic domains like spherical CNNs, mesh CNNs, and equivariant GNNs. So it's quite powerful, and I think why it might be interesting to the audience here is that recently I think four influential quantum machine learning groups have more or less in parallel tried to make a quantum extension to our deep, uh, geometric deep learning blueprint. So there was this work from folks at Los Alamos and X. There was this work, uh, Exploiting Symmetry in Variational Quantum Machine Learning. There's also this, uh, this work on equivariant quantum circuits for learning on weighted graphs. And uh, this work, which came partly from Oxford, partly from Cambridge Quantum at the time, on equivariant quantum graph circuits. So I think there's been quite a lot of concurrent interest in extending these ideas to the quantum domain, and you might find that uh, quite, quite of interest. The second one, uh, which I'm currently very actively working on, I'm trying to get better at learning category theory so that I can use it to uh, unify graph neural network architectures, which is my main area of expertise, and classical algorithmic computation, which is what initially brought me to computer science. And so far, we believe that through the use of polynomial functors, we've been able to get quite far in this uh, pursuit. And we actually have already a preprint on the archive. Graph neural networks are dynamic programmers, which elaborate on this connection in a lot more detail. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot dwell on these for now, but I'd be very happy to talk about either of them as we uh, chat after this talk. Now, on to the main event. The question I want you to keep in the back of your mind during this talk is, can we discover new structure in pure mathematics with the help of machine learning? When we set out to try to answer this question, we actually reached out to several mathematicians we know and trust, and uh, a lot of the response we got initially was super skeptical, even bordering negative. So like, there's no way machine learning will ever be able to help me in the, in the pursuit of mathematics that I'm involved in. But we actually had quite a strong belief that we would be able to do that, and that's because if you really think about how mathematics is conducted, uh, nowadays, it's not just blind application of rules. In fact, very often to make a new mathematical result, one needs a kind of creative leap. There's a bit of creative imagination in there. And maybe the best example of this is uh, Srinivasa Ramanujan, who without any formal mathematical training was able to come up with these fantastic conjectures and theorems that basically felt like they materialized out of thin air. So clearly there's a bit of creativity involved in this kind of whole mathematical process. And maybe one of my personal favorites uh, in making these kinds of leaps from observations, which relates quite a lot to what we've been able to do, is the work of Johannes Kepler. If you're not familiar with his work, he discovered the laws of planetary motion, so how all the planets in the solar system 
uh, the, the laws governing their motion. And the way he arrived at this conclusion was basically by looking at years and years of astronomical data, like just observations of different planets and their positions, and based on that, he was able to spot a regularity in how these planets are moving. And he's famously quoted by saying he first believed he was dreaming when he came up with this regularity. So clearly, mathematics is not just blindly following rules. There's a lot of creativity. There's a lot of imagination. There's a lot of dreaming, a lot of like abstract feelings that can be steered in one way or another as we make our way to new mathematical discoveries. So this is exactly what we wanted to stimulate in our work. Like we don't want to make an artificial intelligence system that will do all of the mathematicians work for them. We want an artificial intelligence system that will carefully help the mathematician in critical moments of their work that they can arrive at conclusions more easily and uncover the structure that's hidden inside complex mathematical objects. So we really want it to be a conversation rather than a replacement. And how we set out to do this, we proposed uh, one possible blueprint in which we can leverage the capabilities of modern supervised machine learning to help certain aspects of mathematical discovery. So let's say if you're a mathematician, you might start by looking at certain objects Z, and you might hypothesize that there are two different quantities you can get from that object, X and Y, and you hypothesize they are related somehow, but there's no proof of this fact. You just believe that it might be the case, or you just might want to investigate the possibility of that being the case. So you assume there might be a function F that maps X to Y, what you can do then, uh, using computational tools or otherwise, you could generate a data set of paired x's and y's over some distribution of underlying object z. This, is, this distribution is quite important. We'll touch upon it soon in this talk. And once you have this data set, you can train a supervised machine learning model to try to predict y from x. Fairly straightforward machine learning task, usually. And sometimes just the act of training a model, which gets a high accuracy, and we've seen this directly happen, can really motivate the mathematician, like encourage them that there really is a connection and therefore inspire them to keep pursuing it if there's a model that gets a high accuracy on this data set. But sometimes, obviously, that's not enough. And neural networks, as we know, are typically black box models. So to really help them and stimulate them on the path to proving something or conjecturing something, we actually further interrogate this pre-trained machine learning model. As you'll see, we use very simple interrogation techniques based on which we can directly give suggestions to the mathematician on where they should look at for a possible uh, conjecture or proof. And hopefully with these two kinds of hints, the mathematician can use enough context to try to conjecture some new candidate function, which might then lead them back to the process of regenerating the data with this new knowledge and the cycle kind of repeats, rinse and repeat on and on, until the mathematician feels confident enough to go ahead and prove the theorem. So this is kind of the general uh, pipeline, and as you can see, these three steps in the middle can be done by computers. The main steps of conjecturing and proving are still left to the mathematician. So this is very important. And, you know, we, we don't claim to be the first group ever to use computers or computation in the pursuit of mathematical pattern discovery. In fact, I'd say it dates back at least to the time of Legendre, who, for his work on the prime number theorem, basically manually studied prime tables and discovered that there's a regularity in the prime numbers, right? And when computation became more available in the 1950s and so on, uh, we had also theorems that were powered, or conjectures that were powered by computation. Maybe one of the most famous examples is the BSD conjecture, which is one of the Millennium Prize problems from Birch and Swinerton Dyer, which used the computer to compute a bunch of examples, but then they still manually studied those examples to come up with an interesting pattern. So what we try to do here is actually use computers for both of these steps. So we could use them to generate our examples for our data, but then we also use computers through the use of machine learning uh, and saliency analysis to try to also detect patterns inside that data and hint to the mathematician where they should look as they set out to prove or conjecture something. Okay. So as I said at the beginning, uh, mathematicians were very skeptical that this would influence many areas of their work. But uh, we actually have, the reason why I'm here standing here and talking to you about this is that we actually have been successful at using this blueprint to make impacts in two distinct areas of mathematics in collaboration with top mathematicians. And the significance of our result has been recognized by the journal Nature, where some months ago we have been on the cover. And maybe more importantly than that, I think some of the comments we got from the reviewers 
who were professional mathematicians in those areas that we contributed to were quite telling. So the mathematician reviewer said, this paper marks the beginning of a new phase in use of computers in mathematical research. They cannot imagine a mathematician not using these methods when they are available because otherwise they would progress much more slowly. And specifically, the experts in the two areas we submitted to uh, both said that our individual mathematical contributions would be sufficiently strong to be publishable in a top journal in the area. And we actually just recently got uh, reviewer comments from one of those separate mathematical submissions. And indeed, we are very close to getting at least one of these papers published in a top mathematical journal. So within this one paper, talking about the use of AI to help mathematicians, we have at least two papers worth of top tier mathematical uh, content. And specifically, the two areas that we tried to uh, support with this blueprint are knot theory and representation theory. I'll be telling you about our individual efforts in both of those shortly. Uh, I will just here quickly say that the knot theory work was done together with Mark uh, Lackenby and Andras Juhasz from the University of Oxford. And the representation theory work was done together with Jordi Williamson, who is a representation theorist at the University of Sydney. And for those of you who are more experts in these two areas and you'd like to know more about the mathematical specifics of what we did, we put both of those individual math papers up on the archive if you'd like to check them out and uh, see what we have done. But uh, what I'm going to focus on for this talk today is to tell you more about how we used machine learning to assist those problems and how uh, our assistance proved helpful. So there will not be a lot of discussion about the maths itself beyond what is necessary to just understand the problem on a high level. So without further ado, let's get started with the knot theory example. This is an example that's good to show first, uh, uh, partly because the intervention of the machine learning model was very simple to the point where anyone who's done like a rudimentary course in machine learning could understand what we've done here. And uh, it's also one that I've been uh, significantly less involved. So in this particular case, I'm not on the uh, mathematical paper that was, uh, that was submitted. So in this case, it's the work of uh, Alex and Nenad from DeepMind, along with Andras and Mark from Oxford. Okay, so as the name implies, in knot theory, we are studying knots, which, uh, uh, as you might know, are these closed loops embedded in three dimensions. They feel a lot like the usual knots you might encounter in the real world with the extra constraint that the loop must close in and of itself. And these are very fascinating objects and you can study them from various perspectives. Because the knot basically crosses itself in many places, you can think of a sort of algebra of those crossings. So there's a way to look at the knot algebraically. But also because they're an object embedded in three dimensions, you can also study them from a geometric perspective and study their topological properties. And for a very long time, it was basically not known if there exists a connection between the algebra and the geometry of a knot. This was a long-standing missing connection. And our co-authors believed that there might be some connection and we wanted to use machine learning to investigate this connection. So basically, just following the blueprint I showed you at the beginning, we have access to a knot, and from that knot we can extract some geometric properties, the geometric invariants, and we can also extract some invariants that come from the algebraic or quantum views. And our question then was to try to relate the two together, as you might expect, by fitting a machine learning model to take one and predict the other. That was the basic idea. To give you a feel for what this data looks like, this is a typical kind of uh, knot table data that you can get for these invariants. So here are just three example knots on the left and the geometric invariants here and the algebraic invariants here. It is not particularly important to know what these are, especially if you're not an expert in topology. What is important is that these data come in all kinds of shapes, sizes, and formats. So you have things like real numbers, you have uh, complex numbers, integers, and you even have polynomials, which we can represent as lists of coefficients, okay? Now, what is the easiest kind of machine learning problem you might want to start in terms of how easy it is to optimize in a well-defined metric and so on? Well, that's usually a classification problem, right? Regression is typically a bit more tricky to do, especially if it can grow unbounded. So here we had a very convenient algebraic invariant of the signature, which was an integer, and therefore could be fit as a classification target. So that's exactly what we did. We trained the multi-layer perceptron model to take all of these geometric invariants as input and predict the signature and an, an integer quantity at the output as a classification problem. So that's it. We just took your standard off-the-shelf multilayer perceptron, we trained it to predict signature from everything geometric, and it was really good. The R squared of the predictions we were getting was about 
So this was very, very encouraging for our math collaborators that, hang on, there might actually be a proper connection between these two ways of looking at the knot. Because we can predict the signature very well from all the geometric inputs. But that in and of itself isn't enough to go ahead and conjecture something because we haven't told them anything about what is it about the geometry that makes the signature well predicted. So we set out to do a very simple saliency analysis, like what are the simplest ways you can inspect what a neural network is looking at? You can check which of the inputs give the most gradient, right, to the prediction. Those are the most important ones. And it turns out when you sort all of these geometric properties by how much gradient they give to the output prediction, you get something that's very telling at the very beginning, right? There is this group of three geometric properties the meridional and the longitudinal translation that seem to be so much more important than everything else. Okay, so what did we do? We took this plot, we came to Mark and Andras and we told them, hey, these three properties are likely to be very, very important for your connection, right? And what they did then is they thought about it for a second and they realized that you can define a quantity using these two translations, which they call the natural slope, which was obscure enough not to ever be put in an actual knot table software, but it proved a very interesting nonlinear combination of these two properties. And from this slope, like if you just plot the slope versus the signature, you get something very, very telling, right? Like it doesn't take an advanced degree in mathematics to see what's going on here. You just look at the axis of the two things and you can basically tell that uh, uh, there's a relationship between two times the signature and the slope, right? So that's probably what our conjecture is going to look like. And now the only thing left to do is to bound how much can you deviate from this linear fit. So after some studying on the knots that we had in our data set, our collaborators were able to come up with the first version of the signature slope conjecture. So two times the signature minus the slope is a very accurate approximation up to the square root of the knots volume. Okay, so that was the first assumption. It worked for all the knots we had in our initial data set. However, well, as you might expect, the distribution matters. And if you just generate knots at random, you're likely to miss the knots that are very interesting for what might break this theory. And in fact, it turns out that when we really tried to break this theory by generating super twisted braided knots, we could actually come up with a counterexample that completely breaks this initial estimate. Like it wasn't possible to make it work with simple fixing. Okay. So this meant we've, we hit a bit of a wall, but what we thought really what this means is that maybe we use just two quantities from the input. Maybe there are more quantities that are important, just a bit less important. So they might feature in this error term, for example. So we went back to our plot that we had before. And what you can notice is when you take these three quantities away and you look at everything else, they're not that important. But these three quantities then stand out as being significantly more important than everything else. So the short geodesic distance, the injectivity radius, and the cusp volume. So we gave these three quantities to the mathematicians saying one of these three might probably be enough to patch your conjecture. And uh, actually, when they took that information and they studied the geometric properties a bit more, they were able to come up with a patched formula where the injectivity radius features in the error term. And this, they were actually able to prove. So this is a theorem that we have now proven. And just uh, in case you were thinking we got lucky with the injectivity radius, they were subsequently also able to prove theorems with one of the other quantities we told them were important too. So they were able to make a deep connection for the first time from the geometric structure of the knot, its slope, volume, and injectivity radius, to an algebraic quantity, which is the signature. And this, uh, if you look at the cover of our nature paper, this formula, this theorem is highlighted in like white lights and kind of uh, showcased on the intersection between machine and, uh, and graph paper. Okay, so this hopefully gives you an idea how even with simple interventions, we're able to make measurable, interesting progress in pure mathematics. But now I wanna tell you more about uh, the second project on representation theory, which has much more complicated objects than just simple flat observations you'd feed into an MLP. And also it's a project where I was substantially more involved. I was actually the lead of the modeling uh, in this particular case because it relied on graph neural networks, which is my expertise. So together with uh, Charles Blundell, Lars Boosting, and Alex Davies on the DeepMind side, and Jordi Williamson from the University of Sydney, we set out to try to settle the combinatorial invariance conjecture, which is one of the longest standing unsolved problems in representation theory. Okay, now 
obviously because I have to introduce the problem in a way in the time constraints that I have. I won't be able to tell you everything that happened throughout development and I'll kind of streamline the theory that's necessary to understand what was going on. But one thing that's important to note in terms of what the interaction looked like, we from DeepMind really didn't know anything about representation theory and Jordi did not know much about machine learning. So a lot of our initial encounters were just two hour deep dives and lectures so that we could all get on the same page and understand our terms in a way that's commonly acceptable. So that's how it went, that's how it was at the beginning and most of the machine learning we've done in the middle uh, was very helpful to derive the final results. So I'll show you some machine learning results here. What's important to note is they're greatly not cherry picked. Like basically I showed you, I'll show you all the experiments that we needed to do on our path to making this result possible. So this is just a few snapshots from just the amazing amount of effort Jordi put in to explain to us what these different objects are, the different algorithms you can do over them, and also defining a lot of terms in a way that for us will be more acceptable. So that was just you know, to show you how that initial stage went. Now I'm ready to actually dive into the theory and tell you about the problem we're trying to solve. So we're studying symmetry groups, should be probably familiar to most of you here. They're groups of transformations that leave the underlying object unchanged. And specifically, what I want you to focus on throughout this part of the talk is permutation groups. So permuting a collection of objects changes the way you see it, but it doesn't change the underlying parts of that object. So you have A, B, C, D, E, you permute those objects in some way, that's still the same set, they just look different to you. And uh, we can conveniently numerically code these uh, permutations like 3, 2, 4, 1, 5, which tells you exactly where each element ends up after being permuted. And the permutation groups are also the essence behind models like graph neural networks. So they were also quite, uh, it was quite interesting to study them in this light for myself as well. Now specifically in this domain, we're going to look at a collection of symmetry groups known as Coxeter groups. And Coxeter groups, uh, in a nutshell, can be fully described in terms of a subset of those transformations, which are known as reflections. And for the specific case of permutation groups, the reflections are the single swaps. So swapping two elements in a sequence and that's all. So if you say have the four element permutation group, also known as S4, there are exactly six reflections. So these six permutations swap two elements and leave everything else the way it is. Okay, now additionally, a group can have a set of generators or in this case known as simple reflections, which are just a collection of these symmetries from which you can recover the entire group by composing. And this is actually a foundation be uh, behind many sorting algorithms for permutation groups, you can generate the whole group by just swapping adjacent elements. So 2, 1, 3, 4, 1, 3, 2, 4, and 1, 2, 4, 3. Transformations that swap just adjacent elements. You can, you can arrange the sequence in any way by just composing those. And we call those simple reflections for the permutation group. Okay, now when I have introduced all of these parts, I can talk to you about how we can represent these Coxeter groups as directed graphs. That will be one of the key objects we're going to be studying. So what we do is we think of each permutation as a node in a graph, which we will later be known as labeled Bruja graph. And okay, we have nodes, the permutations, and we want to draw edges between them. So we draw an edge between two permutations. If you can get from one to the other by performing a reflection, so by performing a swap of two elements. But okay, this graph is still undirected because if I can go from A to B, I can also go from B to A by performing that same swap again. So we need to find a way to make the graph directed and this is how we do it, in an inductive way. We put the identity permutation at the bottom of the graph. We put all the permutations reachable from the identity by a simple reflection, so adjacent swaps, on the first level. And then we proceed inductively by using these simple reflections. And this gives us a height for every single node and we can orient all the edges to point to the higher node, okay? So this now gives us what we know as the labeled Bruja graph. And here's one example of what it looks like for the four element permutation group. So you see here one, two, three, four at the bottom. You see the three adjacent swaps from there on the first level and then so on the second level and so on. You have solid edges which correspond to these simple swaps. And you also have dashed edges which correspond to non-simple swaps that allow you to jump further levels in this graph, okay? So this is the first main object that we will be studying in this particular case. And now let's introduce the, the main star of the event, the combinatorial invariance conjecture. We'll start by taking any two elements in a Coxeter group, so any two permutations in the permutation group, or the two nodes in the graph I just defined. Uh, 
we can define two objects from these two permutations. The first one, called the Bruja interval, is you take that graph I just showed you, you look at all the paths from one permutation to another, and you drop all of this nice labeling information. So you no longer know which node corresponds to which permutation. You don't know which edge is dashed or solid and these kinds of things, right? You just have the isomorphism class of that graph. That's all. Okay? And then you can also define a kajdan lustig polynomial, which conversely uh, is a bit easier to work with, but much harder to properly define. So I, I won't say much other than it's a polynomial with integer coefficients. Okay? And uh, one important thing to uh, note here is that this Bruja interval, as I said, is unlabeled. So we don't know which node or edge corresponds to what. We just have the graph structure. And it's been a long-standing 50-year-old 50 uh, 50 conjecture by Lustig and Dyer that these two objects, the graph and the polynomial, are fundamentally related. That is, that you can compute the polynomial from the graph. Okay? Uh, and this is the combinatorial invariance conjecture. For 50 years, it stood basically without any really serious attack. And if you, if you give me a moment, I'd like to show you why I believe this conjecture withstood attack for so long. So we want to find maps from these graph structures to polynomials with integer coefficients. That's the main problem. And the reason why it's so hard is because patterns in the polynomial emerge quite late by the time these graphs are really big. So here in the four element permutation group I showed you before, all of the polynomials for all the subgraphs are one except for this one called the crown. For the crown, you get one plus Q. So this is the simplest possible example for which a Q appears. And already the structure is a little bit complicated. Now you might be asking, of course, this polynomial can go to any power of Q. So how complicated does this graph get before I get a Q squared? It gets this complicated. This is the smallest graph for which there's a Q squared in the polynomial, right? And as Jordi dutifully remarks here, this is one of the easiest examples. But already at this point, it's a bit tricky for a mathematician to look at this and say anything about what's the structure inside these things, right? So this is, in my opinion, the reason why there hasn't been a lot of progress. We didn't have tools to gaze into these graphs and tell you what are the things that are most important because they get so complicated before the polynomial gets any even mildly complicated, okay? So we want to train a machine learning model to predict the polynomial coefficients from this graph. So there's this graph structure. Once again, all the data has been dropped. You just have the graph structure, nothing else. And the polynomial coefficients as the prediction target. Because they're integers, we can do classification problem once again. And just to show you, this is one of the simplest examples where you have Q and Q squared at the same time. I'm not even going to bother showing you a Q cubed example. Like, this is already way too tricky. Okay, so which model to use? Well, the inputs are graphs and also algorithms that can compute these polynomials if you gave access to all that privileged information we discarded, like what node corresponds to what. Uh, yes? Are the graphs here still the same as the subgraphs? Those are the subgraphs, yes. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's a permutation group of n elements as n factorial permutations, right? So there's a lot of nodes in there. Um, okay. So basically, we knew that the, there existed algorithms that will compute this if you give them access to all that privileged information we discarded. And uh, those algorithms, the equations of them, felt a lot like graph neural networks, which is a model that I'm uh, an expert on. So basically, you compute something for all the neighbors, you sum it up, and then you apply some function that feels a lot like a ReLU activation. So to us, this meant we should use a graph neural network for this and we can treat it as a graph classification task. So take this entire graph at the input, embed it using a graph neural network, and then predict uh, an integer at the output for a particular power of Q, what's the coefficient? Okay, so we tried that. We built a data set of all the interesting intervals up to the nine element permutation group where nine factorial already starts to bite you a little bit. And after training the GNN, well, these are the initial performances we got for the different powers of Q. And as you can see, it was quite performant, like much better than taking the majority class or something like that. So this already gave a lot of encouragement to Jordi that, okay, there could be a formula hidden inside here, but it wasn't completely worked out, right? There were these coefficients that weren't predicted so accurately, like 63% or something. So we went back to the drawing board and we tried to help Jordi see inside these graphs by asking ourselves, what did this GNN learn to do? And, uh, well, we can use the same gradient saliency method we used before to highlight the nodes and edges that got the highest gradient contribution to the output. And this gives us subgraphs like these. To me, and probably to, to many of you, these graphs look useless. 
but we thought we'd try anyway. We sent a bunch of these graphs to Jordi and he stared at them for two weeks. It, it was very hard and he was actually able to tell apart the signal from the noise. Like, uh, yeah, this guy is something else. But basically he was able to figure out that there exists an interesting structure inside these graphs th called diamonds. So something taking the root node and basically these diamond-like structures of the neighboring nodes. He, he found that that appeared quite, a, quite often in the subgraphs we showed him. And there was a lot of related research on these uh, uh, diamonds and the related idea of dihedral intervals. So he hypothesized, okay, these things could be quite important for the prediction that we want to do. So we did an iterative step. Let's compute a bunch of these diamond properties, feed them as extra features for the graph neural network, and let's see how well it performs then. Yep. Like basically at this point, uh, we were saying, okay, there's definitely something here. We're gonna have a conjecture for sure, right? And Jordi also thought, okay, we knew these dihedral intervals were pretty important at this point since they boosted the accuracy by such a huge amount. Now, the last important piece of the puzzle, which allowed us, well, which allowed Jordi to complete the picture and actually propose some conjecture, is we could study of all those edges that got selected because we know those edges correspond to swaps, right? We can check which elements those edges tend to swap. And the heat map we got was very telling. You can see how it tended to prefer swapping element zero and element eight, right? Those were kind of the hottest elements of this heat map, all right? And this insight that the most important edges were extremal reflections, things that swap things that are far away in the sequence, led Jordi to complete the theory that we needed. And in fact, one of the reviewers commented in the Nature paper that the insight that extremal reflection seemed to be crucial is what they would have expected only from a handful of great world experts in representation theory. And it's such a human suggestion that it gave them goosebumps. I quote directly from the, from the review. And basically, you know, this was a completely machine generated insight like this heat map from the salience in us. Yes, but this was specifically for the extremal uh, reflections, not the dihedral intervals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so based on these two together, the dihedral intervals and the extremal reflections, Jordi was able to conjecture about this hypercube decomposition where you find a subgraph here which looks a bit like a hypercube in n dimensions, and then an inductive piece which is a coset in a smaller group from which he conjectured we can compute this uh, KL polynomial inductively. And in fact, he was able to prove a theorem that for every Bruja interval that we have, there is going to be a canonical hypercube decomposition into these two parts that lets you compute the Kale polynomial as the sum of two terms. And what he said is that the inductive term is something very well familiar to experts in representation theory. This hypercube part was completely novel and the suggestion came partly from the machine. So it was very insightful in that regard. And uh, we then wanted to decide, because this doesn't settle the conjecture yet, right? Like, it says there exists one decomposition, it doesn't tell you how to find it. So we wanted to try a bunch of these decompositions to see how often it gets it wrong, and for all the intervals we were able to generate, uh, we haven't found a counterexample. So we actually have a conjecture in our paper saying that no matter what hypercube decomposition you choose, this formula will work. And Jordi put some suggestions in the paper for how you might go ahead and prove it if you're a representation theorist and you're interested in working with these kinds of things. So just a few takeaways. I realize I'm breaking my time limit a little bit. So what I think uh, are the key observations in this work is that I think even simple machine learning interventions, train an MLP, take the saliency of the inputs, can have a large impact in mathematics. And mathematicians are not just theorem provers. They take this kind of insight from the model and they can use it in creative ways. And uh, the method seems particularly appropriate when you want to do this kind of relating of X to Y and you can generate a reasonably large data set of structures, especially if those structures get too complicated before the mathematician can really observe what's going on. And which areas would we need to improve of machine learning or maybe even quantum machine learning to make even more usability of this method? We used very simple explainability techniques and got very lucky. I think to really make this accessible to all of mathematicians, we need to really work on our explainability methods. And further, because mathematical objects can get more complicated than graphs, they can have funky topological structures and symmetry groups, we should work more on geometric deep learning and try to build models that are more suited for those architectures. And lastly, because of the effect of these simple interventions, 
Uh, many of you are mathematicians. Many of you might know good mathematicians. Just reach out to a mathematician near you and try to see how you can help them with the problems that they're facing. We put all of our source code open on GitHub and you can reproduce all of our experiments for both representation theory and not theory without requiring any GPU farm. You just need one GPU to reproduce everything. And lastly, the account I gave today is the account of a machine learning scientist, but obviously we worked for mathematicians and it's insightful to know how it felt for them. Jordy Williamson wrote this fantastic piece for the conversation where he told about how it felt from the mathematician's point of view. And I think there's a lot of insight there that can be interesting even if you don't want to know just about the mathematician's point of view. So I highly recommend reading this particular piece. And that was my last slide. Thank you so much. I hope you found it interesting. And I'd like to thank all my collaborators once again and for inviting me to this event.